evening, everyone. My name is Jenny, and welcome to Real Talk with Jenny. We are on season two, and we are actually on our episode four. So I'm very excited tonight to be uh, talking to someone special. And as you know, last week we've talked about um, the narcissist and the codependent and all that. We will still be talking about that tonight. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, if you are watching from Facebook, uh, don't forget to just say hello because I'm using StreamYard as a platform. I won't be able to see who's watching, but if you say hello, hi, or send a quick message, we will be able to greet you. And if you are watching from YouTube, please don't forget to click that subscribe button if you like all the episodes that we have Click that notification bell if you like and continue watching our episodes. This season two, I decided to talk about um, women, about domestic abuse because that's what I want to advocate in. And I know um, in our previous episodes, we talk about different uh, issues like parenting, um, how the businesses um, cope up during the pandemic. But season two, it'll be slightly different. Um, I already mentioned several times, but I know you haven't heard the full story about it. You will soon hear about it. But yes, being a, a victim of domestic abuse, this is what I, I, I mean, these are the people I want to help. And of course, I mean, not just narrowing to that, but mostly um, reach out to those who are still in the dark, <laughs> as I may say. All right. Okay. So today, I just wanted to share um, a few tips that helped me before I introduce our special guest. Um, some of the things that helped me, I would say, I would say it as self-love habits. That changed my life one of which is gratitude yeah sometimes it's difficult for us to be in that state because we feel sad we feel uh, we feel angry on many things that are going on in our lives but then if we look at the simple things the little things that we have at the moment the people who are beside us the people who are listening to us or even the strangers we meet each day that eventually become our friends really we will see that there are a lot of things to be grateful for and if we're looking at that basically that it will help us change our perspective and will change our mood and you know living that day each day small things it will just give that positive energy into us yeah so that's something that helped me the second thing is letting go <laughs> letting go the hard the hard words to say it's time to let go but sometimes we push ourselves hard to finally achieve that place when we're fi we've finally just let go I see that it is the more we try it harder to let go, the more the more that feeling resists. But if we just leave each day as it is, um, it's it will certainly reach that level when we're finally over it. Yeah, you you may think it's you know it's easier said than done. <laughs> But yes, um, it's really a work in progress. Um, we just have to do it each day because that is what we want. That is the place where we want to be. So slowly. Um, so today, I have forgotten about this. I will not think about this. It's just okay. Then one day, we will reach there. Third, self-awareness. Actually, these are big words. We may need like a few or a lot of episodes to talk about it but I'm just giving you like a few words that may help and later on you can dig deeper into that the third word the third word I have here is self-aware self-awareness many times 
we have we we are in a position position where we say why is this happening to me why is he doing that to me but we are not able to look back um when is that particular moment that led me to this decision that made me go to this point made me go to the right and not to the left sometimes uh it will go down <laughs> to our childhood years um there are days that you know when, when we were growing up we've always wanted that moment that we were we are heard <laughs> and there are times that we aren't we weren't heard so subconsciously those things matter to us when we grow up we automatically have that oh this will happen because of this automatically we think that way even though it's not because we were we were honed we were aligned those small things while growing up it it brought us to a bigger a bigger picture of this person yeah so that's why i would say it's always nice to be a child you know and like we're open to things we're open to experience things we're open to getting hurt feeling sad and not have like a reasoning behind it <laughs> um yeah okay and fourthly i have here detached to things that are beyond my control yeah does this resonate with you <laughs> most of the time we get upset over things that are not even within our boundaries probably your neighbor fighting over another neighbor <laughs> It's not about you. But you know, we get carried away, have that emotion. He should have done this. Why why did he do this? But then again, it's you know, we're wasting our energy over something that we can't really control because it's not about us. <laughs> yes. And lastly, this one I do to myself at times. I call it reparenting. So when things are not well uh I don't I I no longer um how do you say it I no longer blame myself too much what I do is I act like a mom on that small kid that's me and say it's okay Jenny it will be okay tomorrow tomorrow's another day and there's a chance it will be better yeah okay so those were a few tips um that i you know that helped me get over things <laughs> okay at this point i knew you guys are excited i like to say hi to my mom <laughs> she just said hi jenny good evening yes hi hi mama thank you for watching all right so tonight we have a very special guest she is the founder of speak up that's a mental health advocacies um, she's a former public official in a province of manitoba in winnipeg canada as a minister of health she went from being a single mom on social assistance to taking responsibility over six billion health department yeah so you're probably wondering who is she yes so who's this strong lady <laughs> that we have tonight she is no other than sharon blady hi jenny great to see you hi to all your viewers <laughs> Yes, hi Sharon. Good morning to you. <laughs> yes, having, having my morning coffee here. So. Yes. Oh, thank you for and, having me, and I really appreciate how you opened up with those those five steps. That is, those are amazing, and those are the kinds of things that I teach people about as well. So you talked about some brilliant things, and I think we'll probably come back to them over the course of our conversation too yes yes um firstly i'd like to thank you for saying yes to me you were so kind to to say yes and you know be here on the show and talk about all these things 
Oh, well, like I said, thank you for having me. As somebody that survived domestic violence and growing up in an abusive home, uh, women need to talk about this so that we can share our experience and share how we can support each other and tips, tools, anything we can do to limit how many other women this impacts and also limit how much we have to live through before we get out and change the conversation so people know that there's more of us out there and that they can help us. Yeah, so true, so true. We just wanted to um, share what what has transpired uh, uh, in our lives, what are st our stories so that, you know, they may be also in the same boat, but not really ready or some are ready, but just confused. But by sharing and doing all this, hopefully we're able to give them some clarity to evaluate themselves on where they are in their relationship. Um, I often say I am not ad, uh, advocating divorce or annulment or separation, anything like that. We just wanted to state facts on uh, mm -hmm. the things that are happening around us and with regards to domestic abuse. Exactly. That's wonderful. I'm looking yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, today's topic is about narcissists in disguise mm -hmm. because yeah for for many people especially those who have not been in our shoe um they may have a certain picture of a narcissist of that manipulative person of that controlling human being uh, in their in our lives or in their lives but what they don't know is that they're also another face <laughs> Yes, a, a different face, um, which for some just see it on the movies and may think that it doesn't happen in real life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, I agree. I think there's definitely a stereotype and that if somebody and that stereotype, like most other stereotypes, is really exaggerated. And what they don't realize is that some of the most successful narcissists are not these big bombastic huge people with egos they're actually people that often wrap themselves up in this image of i'm the nice person i'm the nice guy i wouldn't hurt a fly and and what actually happens is that they're able to convince everybody that they're the nice guy so that when they do something to someone it's very hard for that person to say that they're being victimized because oh well sure. you're such a nice person there we are okay all right we're back we're back <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're live. Things happen and you're live. <laughs> exactly. I'm just glad you're how fast you're able to get that. So <laughs> where did you lose me? Where did I, I, I suddenly? <laughs> yeah, we're talking about um, the narcissist in disguise. Like most people see they have a certain picture of a yes. narcissist. But then what they didn't know is there is another face. Yes. Yeah, so maybe you can talk us through first on about well, your story. Okay. Well, I mean, for for me, one of the things was the fact that again, this was something that was very different than I, I bought into that stereotype. And I was actually I was raised in a family that it's only as an adult um, and and through going through therapy that you know people said yes, that's actually an abusive. You you grew up with abuse and that yes you did suffer trauma because it had been so normalized that as much as i didn't like it what i didn't realize was that it had set me up for certain things and as much as i sought out people that i thought were different from my father i actually ended up basically perpetuating the same kind of dynamics because that's how i had become as you mentioned you sort of get wired for normal and that's what your normal is and so what was really interesting was watching not just myself but then watching other folks that i know where we would get into relationships with people where this is the person that's the super nice guy and that everybody thinks is super nice and that the little things that were happening that were actually the narcissistic control things were thrown back on you in a way that you were the bad person, like, oh, well, you're so selfish because you're not looking after me this way or that way. And it was, well, wait a minute. Yes, we're spouses. Yes, we're. So I ended up marrying someone that um, I knew through university. And uh, again, my father liked, which I realized in retrospect should have been a big red flag right there. Uh, 
considering who he was. <laughs> But I was, again, I was, you're also put in the position where you're the peacemaker. So that's the other part. Is it not that, you know, we can't all be diplomatic and, and peacemakers, but if you find yourself put in a role where you're forever having to look after someone and that if you don't, it's, um, then you're blamed for being a particular way and that it's your dropping the ball. And that's what happens is, is that it creates trauma and that you end up doing it. And this is fawning. So what happened was I married someone that, I mean, he even said, Oh, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that I would never hurt a fly. Oh, I caught a girlfriend cheating and I never, you know, did anything to her this and that. And he would go on. And so what happened was he cultivated this real, this perception of being the nice guy to everyone so that, what happens is they start building up uh, it's it's psychological and verbal and emotional long before you ever hit physical violence and i think that's mm -hmm. another thing that folks have to understand it yes. was like, well he only hit you once or he only did this once and it's like that's not the first act of violence there's all of those other things that have built up before that's just the first thing in a new territory it's not the first act of abuse and that's one of yeah. the things about the, the, you say the narcissist in disguise, most of them are actually in disguise that way because what it allows them to do is to create a network of people that all believe that they're the nice guy and that they will remain the nice guy to that person because there's no reason for them to abuse or manipulate these people in a way that's at least going to set them, set anybody's alarm bells off. Nobody's spidey senses are going to be tingling about this but what it does do is it gives them allies and reinforcement so that when they do something to someone if that person again like their spouse steps up and says something yeah you're the one that gets questioned like how could you make an accusation like that i still remember you know when my ex assaulted me and the first thing out of my father's mouth every person that i had to call and let them know what was going on where first question was how was i doing how were the kids doing were we safe when it got time to having to like, okay, I better let, you know, again, I'm not close to my father, but I figured he needed, didn't need to be hearing this from other people. First thing out of his mouth was what did you do to make him hit you? And why did you call the police? Like I was the bad person. And I even had a yeah. cousin of mine who, again, this was a woman who was wanting to be a police officer at one point. Mm -hmm. and she again, bought into the same kind of thing where for her, her comment was again, well, why didn't you just stay and fight it out? I would have fought until I was a bloody pulp to protect my kids yeah. and myself. And I'm like, that's not the way this works. And especially, yeah. I'm glad you didn't become a police officer because the reason, you know, when police officers are called to settle these things, they will tell you over and over again that they want you to call them sooner rather than later because it's easier for them to diffuse a situation Part yeah. people go through, you know, do whatever needs to be done through. They don't want to be showing up with ambulances or the coroner's office or anything else like that. Not to so. So this is the thing: is that we have to recognize that um, these folks do operate in disguise, and that it's not when we do get suckered in. It's mm -hmm. not. I blamed myself for. I mean, I have a PhD in women's studies. I've been an active <laughs> feminist. I was elected into public office. Like I have all these different yeah. letters behind my name, life experiences. I should be. Yes. Technically, I shouldn't have let this happen. And it's like happen. no, no. That's that's the whole point. They don't go after. Interestingly enough, these folks also don't go after weak people. They go mm -hmm. after strong people because a victory over or victimizing a weak person isn't really a a victory it's so they true. go after strong people so if you find yourself in a situation where you have been dragged in and abused by a narcissist in disguise don't yeah. sit there and go what's wrong with me go wow mm -hmm. they're a really slick performer and i yeah. and that. i think sharon we haven't mentioned that um is he a pastor or something oh at well, church it was one of my closest <laughs> friends when I was going through this and again was in this place of oh my god I can't believe this because we all go through that phase when you go I can't believe it and this friend of mine who I'd known for years and I knew she was divorced she goes oh I've got a story to tell you she was married to a pastor who everybody loved and he did the exact same thing to her and she literally had an entire church turn on her and she had to walk <laughs> away because nobody could believe that nice pastor so-and-so 
yeah. was this abusive guy. And I just sat there and went, wow, okay. So my ex-husband, yes, he was a good actor, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't getting nominated for an Oscar. This was Oscar <laughs> quality. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh my God. But but again, she didn't know. And, and we have both encountered situations because of the work that we were in where mm -hmm. we run in social circles where our ex-husbands would be there and they would be there with their new spouses and people couldn't believe that that's your abusive ex-husband but he's so nice but he oh well i'm sorry i'm glad <laughs> you only had the nice version of him but would you like to see the police report and would you like to see the photos of the injuries you know just because he did just because somebody didn't do something to you doesn't mean that they're not capable of doing it which is the other big risk that happens with these with the narcissist in disguise mm -hmm. is they don't come with a warning label gosh i wish they were all as big and bombastic as somebody like a donald trump yeah. you could just run think, away from that <laughs> screaming it's like oh my god yeah. that's like a big parade coming where you just see it i and know go over here then you can go the other way right exactly. you can run away all the red flags are coming down the parade route and you just yeah. go and turn in another direction they don't do that and then what happens is we do get caught in there we do get into there and then when you do try to say something and you do try to get yourself out sometimes we don't get support immediately we get those well why didn't you this or what about that and we get victim blamed and that actually feeds into what the narcissist has done to us where we're questioning ourselves our values mm -hmm. am i the bad person did i do something wrong when we're not <laughs> yeah so true um yeah they say narcissists is very good at pleasing other people than their family yes oh definitely well and pleasing other people as so far as it serves them so yeah. um it, yeah they'll keep i mean i that was one of my things growing up was realizing how my father would do things particular ways so that it looked like we had a normal functional household and he you know he tried running for office he did different things and but what was happening inside the four walls of our house was very different. Now, the one thing that happens is they usually at some point show their true colors to other folks eventually, but it takes a while. And yeah. so I would later find out from folks that I knew that, um, yeah, they had picked up on things and that, but they had to maintain a certain, you know, for example, if they were folks that he knew through the church, that they just, they dealt with him. It was the, okay, mm -hmm. you know, they recognized what was in and outside of their control. They dealt with him in the parish and then they just, you know, yeah. they moved on, but you know, they felt that they, they kept a distance and also they weren't invested the same way my mom, my brother and I yeah. were, so. So yeah. true. Um, yeah, before I'm going to ask you a question, I'd like to say hi to Joni. Hi, Joni. Thank you for watching. Hi. Yeah. So, guys, um, if you have questions, please feel free to send them in and uh, Sharon and I will be happy to answer them for you in a bit. Yeah. Um, Sharon, so what we're saying is that your dad is somehow in the same in the same boat should it should we say your dad is somehow a narcissist or oh absolutely. not like that like it's one of those things that as i got older and especially started going and doing work in mental health it's like the oh geez like his name should be under the definition in the dictionary so there's a pattern and he fall he, he, oh, he falls, falls in that it. yes like you could use him as a textbook case <laughs> and and but what's interesting is when you're raised by somebody like that and this is where again a lot of women you're raised by somebody like that and that's your normal and you don't mm -hmm. feel a lot you know that there's something wrong about it but you don't know what it is and so we sometimes yeah. in a sense get wired to do the exact same thing and find the exact same people even if we're actively trying to find somebody different the things that we're looking for in terms of what's the same and what's different are not always the things we should be looking for but we don't know that so you look for yeah. the obvious things and then what you find is that it's a, a different kind it's a, a narcissist in a different disguise so mm -hmm. the person on the inside is the same, but the problem was that you were looking at the, the elements that were oh, related to the disguise. It. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're looking at, you know, literally the, the, the jacket and the coat, not the person inside the jacket. Inside the coat, yeah. So not looking closely. But you did mention there are a few red flags. So when you said that because your dad liked him, so that could have been a red flag. 
yeah, but then no- I mean literally um is there any um one or two signs that you may have seen just before you get on to the marriage or be yeah. boyfriends and girlfriends well what was interesting about that was that I actually was having um second I was feeling a little twitchy about things as we got closer and closer to the marriage and mm-hmm. what was interesting was that I actually had family members that would say to me oh well it's just you're not used to a normal relationship because most of the folks that I had gone out with I was my, my background is in arts and I was mm-hmm. very much involved in the arts and the music community and so my yeah. family didn't like the fact that I mostly hung out with and I mostly dated you know, people that were artists and authors and, you know, involved in the music scene. So when he came along and had what they considered a stable, regular job, they just said, oh, well, you don't know what it's like to be involved with a normal person. That's all. That's all it is. So I actually got gaslit by my own family. My mother has since mm-hmm. apologized for it. But what happens is, is that sometimes we do have red flags go off. And it was things like, again, when people talk about controlling, well, controlling is not always about giving orders and telling you not to do something controlling can be a lot more subtle like mm-hmm. um oh you know what i'm just not feeling up to doing that so can we cancel that put those plans with your friends and that you find that certain things are always getting canceled and but they're getting canceled in a way that again it's not that you can't do this it's the oh yeah. wait a second i need so it's the if you're finding that suddenly your circle of friends is limited if um, what it is that you can do, if you're suddenly no longer able to do the things that you enjoy, because, well, I don't really like that as much, or I guess if you're going to do that, fine. And so it was these little things where I was finding parts of my world were getting chipped away at. Um, And and certain people that, well, you know, I really don't enjoy hanging out with so-and-so, why Mm -hmm. don't we hang out with my friends instead? Why don't we do this instead? And so it was that kind. So there was that kind of control. Uh, Weird little things, too. And this is going to sound like a really strange one. But uh, in terms of, for example, sharing household tasks. So we always had a thing where it's like the one person cooks and the Mm -hmm. other person will clean up after dinner. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. I mean, I would cook and I would prepare stuff, but I would also tidy up along the way because for me, it was a case of you know, small kitchen, just want to make sure that I've got room so I will tidy stuff up yeah. and and try not to make a mess. So, yes, he had stuff to clean up, but it was, you know, all stacked up, ready to go, and it was a certain amount of stuff. I would come into the kitchen. <laughs> First of all, it was don't come in while I'm cooking. If I'm supposed to be cooking, let me cook. And then I would come in and I'd be like, how did you use all of the pots? Like, we did not have a seven-course meal. <laughs> it was like that, where if I would make a comment, it's like, well, I pick up after you, after you clean. Why are you... And, and, and it would be those weird little flips, not any kind of understanding of, okay, what can I do differently? Or, okay, mm-hmm. fine, you said that I didn't need to use three pots to make this one dish. What, you know, do you have any suggestions on how I could do it differently? So it was always taking things and throwing them back. And a lot of things that will cause you to question your own judgment. That's another one. If, if when somebody is saying something to you and uh, it's making you question, are you right? Are you wrong? Yeah. Are you a bad person. There's another red flag. And a lot of times, and this is the, I would say the big one, and it ties to this, is yeah. taking, in taking responsibility you talked about self-awareness. So with self-awareness, yes. it's that understanding of, okay, where am I and where do I fit into this equation and what might I be doing that is, um, you know, contributing to maybe a disagreement about something or some other kind of sure. dynamic. And when you take responsibility for something and you come to someone and say, well, you know what, I've looked at the situation and I realized that, you know what, yeah, I was kind of tired and maybe I was a little, uh, I snapped and, and mm-hmm. I got a little angry. Maybe I shouldn't have been so angry. Well, if that person says to you, you know what, you're right. And you should have this and you should have that. When, oh, when, they will never say that, right? They will, exactly. they will never, <laughs> they say, will it never ever say that you and, are and, right. And <laughs> because going, you are always wrong in their uh, sight. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's this thing about two people, you know, it takes two and you're each responsible for 50% of the situation. And so what happens is as soon as you start to admit some of the stuff on your path and you go so so in other words you take responsibility and you say okay this is the thing that i did and it's 10 percent. well they suddenly take that 10 percent 10 percent, and they stretch it out to 100 so as soon as you admit so as you as soon as you admit to some sort of self-awareness and your role in things 
Mm-hmm. They just use that as the opportunity to blame you for the entire situation, as opposed to going, you know what? Yes. Okay. You know what? You were tired and yes, you did snap and that set me off. But I also realized that maybe if I had done this and if I had done that, then that yeah. would happen. Oh, okay. Now we have a balancing act. But if you, yeah, so that's like a mutual conversation. Exactly. So yeah. there's another red flag that if you're trying to do the thing where somebody said, well, you know, instead of just getting angry with them, see where you fit in. And as soon as if you go and do that, and if you go in and take responsibility for your part, mm-hmm. and they suddenly say that your 10% is worth 100% and they did absolutely yeah. nothing wrong. <laughs> Again, big parade of red flags, big yes. parade of red flags. <laughs> they have to be willing or they don't know how to apologize. There's another one. I'm sorry you feel that way. But there's also a fake apologizing, right? Uh-huh. Well, it's there's, not the fake apologies. They're the kings. Is, is that apologies. is that a love bomb when you're when you're in the middle of that um, yeah. fight and then there's a crying and there's a something like that and then but then the next day it's all the same. It's all the same. Yeah. So it's the honeymoon period. It's the the love bomb. It's the uh, the fake apology. Like the I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, uh, you know, as opposed to I'm sorry that I did this. And that yeah. makes you feel this way and brings out, you know, that's the more. And I now that I know that I will do my best to not do that. What could I do instead in this situation? What would help you? That's I mean, a, a proper apology acknowledges that something was done that hurt someone, whether intentionally or not, but that you you did a thing that hurt someone and you take responsibility for that. Then you, you know try to rectify the behavior and say, you know, I won't do that again. What can I do instead? How can mm-hmm. I go about doing that? As opposed to saying, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not an apology. <laughs> that's You're not really owning anything. And, and True. So, so that's another, th- those would be the kinds of red flags that, you know, again, the, the not apologizing, the making you question your own behavior, the making your, when you take responsibility, suddenly be the entire you're you're responsible for whatever went wrong uh those things that again cause you to question what you're doing how you're doing and that start either limiting your social circles your interactions anything that starts closing you off from other people because then that way once they've got you in that little silo in those tiny little ways and then they create a nice little echo chamber for you to live in and for you to question yourself and 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 take what they're saying as more true than your own feelings yeah so basically that slowly um each day you get that confusion you get that doubt and it builds up and then at the end of the day you lost the confidence already Mm -hmm. and you know the self-esteem went down very low and yeah and and we, we live in behaviors where we're always trying to prevent a fight what do I do to stop the thing? What do I do? So you're, if you also find yourself in a situation where you have to, where you're dancing around somebody else and you feel like you're living on eggshells because you're just trying to prevent a fight, just trying to keep the conflict down, there's another red flag. If you're in a, re, in a relationship with another responsible, empathetic person, yes, mm-hmm. you're going to have you know ups and downs and disagreements, yeah. but you shouldn't be avoiding fights and and being the one that always has to be the diplomat, because if you're always having to be the diplomat, there's a sign that, again, that there's something wrong. wrong. That's another <laughs> red flag. Yeah. Um, we'd like to say hi to Ginger. Hi, Ginger. And she said that she's a narcissist. Ginger, in what way are you saying you're a narcissist? So, uh, yeah, so it's also right. Sometimes it's not just a, the men who's yeah. a narcissist. It could be a uh, a woman in that relationship who's a narcissist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, too, that sometimes women get called narcissists um, when they are assertive, have their own boundaries and this and that. So sometimes what's interesting, we have to watch as women, not that yeah. we can't be narcissists, that, and there's a certain element of narcissism that, or, or what people construe as, it's that very small bit that we all have that's part of our mm-hmm. own go in our own confidence and a lot of times with women we get called narcissists because we have the gall to stand up for ourselves speak up yeah. and do those things so sometimes we need to watch it's not to say that somebody isn't but also don't let somebody put that label on you because a lot yeah. of times that's actually what the narcissist does is they accuse you of being what they are because yeah <laughs> <laughs> so 
Again, not, exactly. not somebody else's self-awareness, but just that whole thing. Watch when somebody else calls you that as a woman. Sure. And, we, we, and, and the thing is, you can grow and change from it if you are self-aware enough to do it. Yeah. Sometimes also when we are, I wouldn't say it's hard-headed, but when we know exactly what we want, and the other person cannot infiltrate our system, then yeah, that's a misconception. But that's for me, that's not really being a narcissist. It's just being um, that person who value herself, who have that probably self-love in her that um, hopefully no narcissist can come into her life. Yeah. The, the people that don't like your, that, that get upset about your boundaries are the people that wish you didn't have boundaries because it gets in the way of what they want to do. So whenever you get pushed back about your boundaries, that's usually also another red flag because that's somebody that wishes that you didn't have boundaries. Your boundaries are getting in the way. Yeah. Sharon, um, as, as they always say, the narcissist is like a match made in heaven with a codependent. But you, you are, very, you are a strong woman. You know all these things about um, being a feminist or what, are your rights as a woman how do you put how do you how do you what do you say about that like a narcissist matches a codependent are you in any way have become like a codependent at some point i i, I think i did and what what's interesting is how the two are related to each other so in other words being raised a particular way was actually what made me go down that path of being a feminist mm -hmm. and it was it was being raised by a certain kind of father and it was all of these things about the expectation so it was interesting because it gave me the skill set to put up a fight and do certain kinds of things and achieve certain things. But what was interesting was that as much as it allowed me to do things that I would call very external, because I was focusing all that energy on the external and I did all of those things, I didn't quite ever get to the place where I recognized the difference between the internal and the external. So what happened was I was able to do all of those things, thought I was growing. And I mean, and I was growing and I was accomplishing things. But what I hadn't done was check the, funda the fundamental stuff that had literally become wired within me. So in other words, it's one thing to fight an abstract entity, mm -hmm. and to, you know, fight for political change or study particular things and do things where there isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one emotional investment. What happens is then you get into relationships with when you start talking about things as individuals, well, then it's a little bit different. And it's also part of a network. I think a lot of, of us forget that mm -hmm. literally our families and our social circles are like yeah. little closed systems that reinforce themselves. So what happens is that you, you bring people into that system that end up fitting into it. And, and if somebody doesn't fit, well, that's the boyfriend that, you know, never survives past the first dinner with the family kind of thing and, um, and other stuff like that. So that what happens is that on that level, it, it's almost like you're, I don't want to say you're two different people, but there's, it's different. And, and what you find is that you end up because of what I saw my mother engaging in and how I was taught to engage, mm -hmm. I was, I was totally primed to be. Uh, a, a codependent person and what happened was it was this weird thing you didn't realize you were living two separate lives and especially too if your spouse is the kind of again as somebody that's in, in disguise talks about how they're a feminist and how they support you and all this and that but again they say those things that's the coat right they got that coat and they got the right coat and hat on and that's part of their act but then mm -hmm. when you're at home you're noticing that there are things that are different but they're not so different or, or again, they flip the script on you. And it's like, well, I thought we were supposed to both supposed, supposed to do the dishes and we're both supposed to do this. And, and mm -hmm. so why is it that when you do it, you complain, I thought you were a feminist and you know, mm -hmm. if I do the dishes on these days, then you're going to do them on that day. So there was always a way of, of flipping the argument. There was a show that I watched. Yeah, they're very good at that. <laughs> oh, there was, there was, there was one episode. I don't know. They're how a master of that. <laughs> Uh, it, I'm trying to remember which episode it was. There's a, a K drama called um, Love Featuring Marriage and Divorce. And they're in the second season, there is a couple where he is a psychiatrist and he has been cheating on his wife. She finds she finally finds out she wants a divorce. And there is an episode where it is literally the bulk of it is the two of them in conversation 
and him gaslighting her and flipping the script and trying to make everything uh, her fault. And so it's everything about how, you know, he really didn't cheat on her. It was just a mistake. She should forgive him. And it was this weird thing where I'm like, oh my God, if I was going to teach a course, I would just, I would pull this episode up. <laughs> and just snippets put that on the projector. Would, Watch exactly, this. This is what would, I'm talking about. <laughs> exactly. I would use snippets of other episodes to give you the backstory. And then it would be just like, we're going to take this one hour episode and this is going to be the next three lectures and we are just going to break down everything. And it was this weird thing to watch because very few shows, you know, of any type go into that much dialogue where you just spend the bulk of an episode on, on one conversation. So it was really, mm -hmm. interesting, but it was like the, Oh my God, this is like my marriage in one episode. <laughs> and yeah. I could almost sit there and go, oh, he said that, and he said that, oh, and he did that, and he did that. It was like, again, I don't know who wrote this. I don't know what their intention was with that episode, but I would use, I, I could literally write like a chapter or, or do an entire course on, on 40 minutes because it was everything that was in there, and you could see how it worked. You could see where she would start to, oh, and then it'd be, oh, wait a second, hold on, and she would just come back to that core you cheated on me this and that so what was really brilliant about it was watching her ability to not after all of these years mm -hmm. to not get sucked in again and that was also a really hopeful message as well so so no it, it, it's those little things and i think that's the other part that folks have to recognize is that yeah. it's all it's all about little bite-sized chunks and baby steps so nobody it's not like a ski hill where you just fall straight down and this is little bits and it's it's steps and that's the other reason why so like you say i was i first of all i was conditioned to this and then second of all mm -hmm. it happens in little steps and so it's not till you're in the middle of it so that happens i think probably to most of us and it, like i said yes. before they don't want to take down weak people. There's no victory in taking down a weak person. So if you're a strong person that has got all of these other successes in life and you go, well, how did I do this? How did this yeah. happen to me? It's because you're strong. They went after you. They, you're, you're, you're a good catch and there's more of a victory in it and there's nothing wrong with you. They just gave an Oscar winning performance. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. And what's, What's um, I mean, what people don't know is it's a psychological war in that relationship. Oh. And just by staying in that relationship, if it's a long time before you finally get out, can you imagine how you've lasted all those years fighting over yourself, saying, I know I'm right, but, he, but it doesn't feel that I'm right. Yeah. doubting yourself and things like that so basically that those are signs that you are a strong woman you've lasted that and you've kept your sanity and later on we will talk about how this you know being in that narcissist environment could could lead to a person committing suicide thinking that you know it's the end of the road for them you know at one point i said okay um whoever whoever will be the last man standing and then that's it it means i don't really care if i die at that point mm -hmm. or if i'm the one who will be you know um yeah. the last person to stand up so things like that it's you know what we're talking about domestic abuse but there is a there is a mental health issue also that correlates to it Oh, yeah. absolutely. And that's the other part, too, is that those of, first of all, if you have a pre-existing mental health condition, so if you are already disposed to having depression or any other mental health issue, you're actually more likely to get, now it's not saying it's a guarantee, but it's yeah. easier to get drawn in because you've already got the battle with the inner critic going on in your head, that that inner voice of self self-doubt. But even if you don't and you get drawn in, Again, this is traumatizing behavior. So I think a lot of times when we think about trauma, a lot of people will think about, oh, you survived an earthquake or you survived a car accident or there was this fire yeah. or some other. And they think a big thing. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that there's there's adverse experiences. And again, things like verbal and emotional abuse and these smaller things, it's actually about those things. And those are harder to detect. And interestingly yes. enough, the research shows that people will 
more easily recover from some sort of the ones. <laughs> natural event. Yeah, the physical That's thing. The physical stuff. Whereas this stuff is, so what happens is that we're trauma survivors as well. So you end up usually with complex PTSD or PTSD and that affects your how you think and that causes that whole thing where yeah you can get to a place where you're just tired of fighting and then maybe i am this bad evil person maybe i am all of these things and i don't have the energy to go on and maybe if i was just wrong you know i i should just i should just be gone and this and so no it does lead to that and then a lot of women um a lot of people who are victims of this will find themselves in that place and what, mm-hmm. what other folks don't realize is that they've been put in that place. This is not about somebody's weakness. This is about wanting to get out of hell. And they don't know how any other way of getting out of hell because maybe they don't have the supports and someone they can talk to. Maybe, you know, again, this, the, the family or the community that we're a part of tells us, well, no, you're just supposed, you know, marriage isn't perfect. There's always going to be fights. Um, you know, you just suck it up and move on. Grandpa and I were married for X number of years and we just got through it. Maybe your community and your church, the value that's placed on marriage and family. You're, I mean, my mother was the, the same priest that used to hear my father's confessions every week as he was cheating. Uh, you know, he would cheat all week, go to confession and then turn around and help the priest at mass and hand out, you know, communion and wine. Yeah. And, and was the parish, you know, the, the president of the parish council. Um, and then we go back to cheating and, you know, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, do this over and over Just again. Just repeat, say, over and over again. put up with this. When my mother said, found out and she wanted to file for divorce, the priest gave her heck for wanting a divorce and breaking up the family. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. Why is she the one being blamed here? Because she wants out and doesn't want the financial ties and doesn't want the abuse. Meanwhile, you've been hearing this guy's confessions for how many over and over how many years and it's not like he's been changing his behavior um so those kinds of things like that my mother walked away from the church for several years because she felt like she was being re-victimized and then she's not being heard right it's like she's not being heard well exactly and so then when she did go and file for divorce my father went and said fine you're going to file for divorce i'm going to file for an annulment and my father actually managed to get a marriage of 22 years with two kids annulled so that he could marry in the church the woman that he'd been having the affair with. I oh mean, my. that doesn't... The same parish priest? Yeah. It, 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 strangely enough, it was a different priest. I couldn't believe oh, okay. it. The had moved on and moved to a different church. But that was the whole thing, too, is they moved on to a different church where they got to lay whole new groundwork and look like this other you know they came in as a new couple with none of the previous baggage and they even taught the marriage prep course in the church and i was just yeah. like wait a minute you're the don't list you two are the don't list yeah, like, no. so, um, you know so but that's the thing is if you're surrounded by that it's very hard to leave because that that's like, another that's, thing right that's it's a like whole- a social it's a society it's like dictating women don't have a say in that relationship you know they just have to say yes and yes and yes and take it what's happening what's going on in in that relationship Mm -hmm. and just let yourself be hurt battered or whatever yeah it's it's i'm sorry but that's totally unfair yeah well it is unfair but it makes it really tough because you know when you're part of especially a faith community and a larger um you know society and community that means a lot to you and that a lot of times mm. to to leave means that you end up having to leave your community and what's supposed to be your support network so that's the other thing mm. is that women should sure. never feel it, you're recognize that you are in a tough spot um yeah. that it's not easy that it is going to involve making some very hard choices but recognize that you're not wrong it's just that the system in some respects is set up against you so it's not that you're you're doing a bad thing it's just that all of these things exist as additional unfair barriers and that not you know don't give up figure out what what's going to work for you but most importantly it's your safety and your peace of mind that matters yeah. the most and your mental health yeah i think one thing is that nowadays somehow it's different you know women has a voice already 
and uh, here in the Philippines we have vows is violin uh, that's the something about uh, again uh, what do you call that um, yeah if you are a victim of violence you know the government will step in to help yeah at some point yeah no and that's so, the thing, is that laws have definitely improved um, so yeah. I, again I think of what happened when I was a child and versus what was happening as an adult and we are making progress but we're yeah. still some folks will say oh it's all over and done with it's all good and and then what do you have to worry about but there's still a lot of um, there's stigma it's still yeah. not equal it's still not um, uh, easy for us to do and yeah. it doesn't mean that men aren't victims in their own way but still statistically women are at the greater disadvantage and that we mm -hmm. don't often have the same economic resources as well and I think that was the one thing that I recognized I was very fortunate so everything that I went through with my ex-husband it wasn't till the day after the election he mm -hmm. wasn't expecting me to win and I mean I I was the outsider that you know that I knew that I was taking a risk in running and how I looked at it was that you know everything was a win situation so mm -hmm. I I went into that and then I ended up not just winning but winning in a landslide and so the wow. next day he and my father both went after me and that he assaulted me actually at my father's place because why not um, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to call the police because mm -hmm. what happened was my face was on the front of the newspaper because I had won a landslide victory we had hit yeah. a place um, there, there's what's called critical mass that when you get um, 33 34 percent of women in an elected body that's mm -hmm. considered this shift that then brings in more progressive legislation so we hit critical mass so there was all of us that had been elected on the front page of the newspaper mm -hmm. and I knew that if I called the police that I ran the risk of my entire career being under a microscope and being on the front of the newspaper yeah. so I was able to do different things I eventually got him out of the house he would do you know there, there was a whole lot of drama and then what would happen is I would get uh, diagnosed with cancer um, so he, he was doing things that involved the kids like he assaulted he, he well he did something as we, as I was bringing my son to his first day of daycare that again mm -hmm. Friction. What would end up happening is he would assault me literally four days before I got my official cancer diagnosis mm. and right before Christmas. And I called the police then and mm -hmm. then spent the next few years under protection order. But what was interesting was that as this was all unfolding, as much mm -hmm. as I was like, oh my God, this is really awful, it was the wait a minute, I'm doing this as a woman that's elected into office. So, yes, there's the whole, how can yeah. this happen to me? But it's the wait a second. What's my job? My job is legislation. <laughs> True. How many other women are in a You have the power to... now to help women. Yeah. So I just went, okay, hold on. Life is handing me a bunch of lemons. I could sit here and suck on them and be bitter. Or I'm mm. going to take these and I'm going to make a whole bunch of lemonade for other people. So there yes. was a piece of legislation that had come in and we were reviewing it. And it was about... Um, safety procedures in daycare so that there would be universal policies across the province and mm -hmm. so one of the areas i sat there in legislative review and it talked about um, a policy where everyone had to have a policy related to if someone enters into the daycare in a violent manner with a weapon and i said well why just with a weapon i said most of the violence that you're any anything that anybody entering in a sure. threatening way into a daycare it's not going to yeah. be a random shooter guy that it's, it's, that's it's, a traumatic it's, thing for it traumatic thing for it, kids what it's going yeah. to be, is it's going to be some sort of custody thing some sort of domestic thing and i said i've just literally weeks ago had my ex pin my son and I in a stairwell as I tried to take him to his first day of daycare and so there was no weapon involved there was nothing but the daycare staff were freaked out we were clearly freaked out so mm -hmm. I said yes definitely have stuff for a weapon but don't limit it to just a weapon because yeah. most, of the, most of the stuff that a daycare is going to have to deal with with someone behaving in a threatening manner is not going to be an armed stranger it's going to be a parent behaving badly in an abusive way as a result of something related to custody or something like that and so it was like there was the first little twitch the first little thing mm -hmm. then i got involved with different 
uh, the Family Violence Prevention Committee and other mm -hmm. different things. And so that, and even did domestic violence legislation and other human rights legislation that was all based on, I wish this law was there when I was mm -hmm. here. I wish I had yeah. this instead. Uh, or again, I was lucky enough to be able to get him out of the house. It dragged out my mm -hmm. divorce for seven years, but I knew that there were folks that were victims that were living in apartments and they couldn't move out of their apartments because yeah. they were both on the lease or she's on the lease and it's, technically it's hers, but he lives there. So mm -hmm. she's going to move out and have to pay the rent while he lives there. And so it was a way of, of people being able to break their lease if they were a victim. Mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where my experience was awful, but I knew other people were going through worse. And so it made me feel better. And it was part of my own healing to go, what can I do for other people? But a yeah. lot of times it takes folks like us to get into government and to be sitting at a table and you're that one hand that goes up and says, well, what about this? And, and nobody else in the room, because they've never what been through it, has thought of that. And they're suddenly all going, oh, oh, didn't know that was a thing. Okay, hold on. <laughs> rewrite, rewrite, hold on. So that's but it's, it's something good because you are there, you have experienced it. And because normally when people, they would just write probably the law basically from someone else's, but not in full details. But with you being there, you're just a live case study that they can <laughs> <laughs> just exactly. talk about while writing the legislation. Yeah, exactly. So they, they exactly. They're usually going off stats and data and all of these other things that, again, are really valuable. But having somebody that's been through that, you see it with a totally different set of eyes. So that's the other part, too, is that it's really awful to have gone through this. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. And at the same yeah. time, know that for all of the hell that you might be going through, you have something that you can either use to help yourself, help others. And it doesn't mean you have to, like I said, I took advantage of that situation because to me, it was something I could do. You don't have to do Perhaps you were brought to that place exactly. because you, you have to do something about it. Exactly. So that's the other part is surviving something doesn't mean now you have this big burden of responsibility to look after other people uh, and that you have to fight some sort of, you know, big battle. But you don't know at the time what you've gone through, how it might be useful in future. And that's why mm -hmm. like, I enjoy talking to someone like you because I know that there's some other woman out there that's listening to something and going, oh, that sounds really familiar. So I'm not alone. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not crazy. I, th this, is, this is the way I'm supposed to be feeling about this. I can, oh, I'm strong. I can do this. If one person hears this and can take something from it, like that that's the other part is we need to talk about this so that yeah. women realize that they're not alone and that they can do things together because a lot of times how we end up stuck in those places is because we are you know walled off and we feel alone so true and uh, this pandemic and lockdowns are not really helping at the moment mm. for women or men who are in that situation Yes. So, yeah, here Never. in the Philippines, we can see numbers growing um, in terms of domestic abuse. I think it's all over the globe. And, uh, you know, this may be a little thing, um, but we hope it helps. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the other part, too, is to understand that a lot of folks are trapped right now. And it's what you do to get through it and know that this isn't going to last forever. If you can find ways out, great. At this point, it's just about, like everything else with the pandemic, it's just about getting through it as best as possible and maybe even use this as an opportunity for planning. That's the other part, too, is that a lot of times we see stuff in movies where it's about such and such a day, this finally happened, and then so-and-so just packed up her kids and ran away. And don't get me wrong, that stuff happens, but a lot of times yeah. it takes more planning, but we're often afraid to plan for fear that our plans will be found out. And I mean, you and I talked about that little lipstick tube that I yes, used. Yes, I was about oh. to to mention yeah. so, that lipstick tool that you mentioned, which is which I think is really brilliant. Yeah, so, so when I was in office, there was a company, and I wish I could remember which company it was now. Something makes me want to say that it was like something like Mary Kate. But what they had done was they had 
empty lipstick tubes from their product line. They had even put, a, they, they had stickers of different colors on them, but what they actually mm -hmm. were hollow lipstick tubes that they would give to local women's organizations so that they could fill them with all the information relative to that area. So it was the, what are the numbers of the shelters? What are the numbers of all the different kinds of supports, legal supports that women could access? And it was all on this long piece of paper rolled up in the mm -hmm. tube. And then somebody like myself would have them in my office. And what I could do is that if I was meeting with somebody and it turns out that that maybe domestic violence was part of the issue that they were experiencing, I could just slip this woman a lipstick tube and it had all of these resources in it. So even if yeah. she's got a, a, a partner that is rifling through all of her stuff, who's going to like, what guy is going to open up a lipstick tube to see whether there's, yeah. you know, and so yeah, I think, I think we want to there. mention, yeah, sorry. I think we want to mention to them that this happens, you know, a narcissist person would entirely go to all your stuff, yeah. even your phone contacts oh, and see God. who are you calling, who are you texting, yeah. uh, and all those things and when you're on the phone trying to see who are you talking to yes so that's why i did mention to sharon that that lipstick tool was actually a brilliant idea yes and if there's anybody out there in the cosmetic industry i have to like i said i've probably still got some in a box in my basement related to um you know when i was in office but that is a wonderful idea and that i think it's in one level on one level it's sad that it still needs to be out there but I think mm -hmm. it's a wonderful tool because the other part, like you're mentioning with phones, is that phones and different things can be tracked. And I, again, I know yeah. you don't have pay phones the way we used to and other things, but there's still ways that you can do different things. But having it on a written piece of paper, just in case your phone does get taken away from you or anything else, like this is something that you can hide, that you can add. That was the other part was that it had spots that you could fill in, you can write, you can roll up another piece of paper. It was a nice little thing because it allowed women to plan and it even helped them plan. So get the following things together and how to get it together where it's not like, okay, you're not stacking up luggage right outside the front door. you like, you're ready. <laughs> that won't plan. work. No, that won't work. We know that. <laughs> that won't work. So it was a way of helping you plan um, subtly and strategically because that's the other part too, is it's not easy to leave. Part of the reason why I did the legislation that I did that allowed people to break their leases is that we found that it takes about seven times uh, of trying to leave before a mm -hmm. woman will actually uh, leave and and be gone for good and leave the situation. And it's often yeah. because of, you know, again, not having a place to go to, still being tied to a, a lease or a mortgage or something. All of yeah. the Some of them are financially dependent. So exactly. that's also a type of abuse that... Yes. So it's how do you make, um, how do you make things easier? And we can't make... At this point, we haven't got it all sorted out, but any kind of tool that you can give somebody. So again, anybody out in the cosmetics industry that's got extra <laughs> lipstick tube, yeah, a wonderful um, human rights, social justice, philanthropic <laughs> activity. That you can do True. Is, is find a women's rights organization, domestic violence or a uh, support organization, and give them li lipstick tubes and 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 with all of this kind of information, Numbers, that they yeah. can organize and use to the best. Um, a, to the best needs of the women that they're serving because that's the other part is every community uh these organizations they always know what the women in their community need more so what folks in my neighborhood would need might be very different than what somebody yeah. else would need in another part of the country or another part of the world true um but i think uh one thing also is for that person to be ready to accept the situation that's another thing because as I as um, I think a few episodes I mentioned that sometimes we are willing to help share all the information that we have, share our stories. But at some point, it is hard to accept that this is happening yeah. to us. Oh, exactly. I mean, we experienced that ourselves. It, like, if it took a while, like long while, <laughs> before. I finally accepted. Yeah, there's no change happening. Well, change is not happening very soon. Yeah, I'm and doing that, all this work. Yeah. I'm trying to take responsibility for maybe am I, am I doing something wrong? Can I do something differently? And things aren't changing. And that's the other part is that, um, yeah, the acceptance and and part of it both well, going to that argument thing about you know taking who you know are, are they taking your ten percent and turning it into a hundred percent responsibility when you have those kinds of moments 
also recognize it's not a failure because I think that's the other part too is that mm-hmm. you know we talk about a failed marriage leaving a failed yeah. marriage it's not a failure you did your best yeah you did everything that you could and if there's any failure it's the fact that it wasn't complete and there weren't two people carrying the weight equally and carrying the responsibility so yeah. you've done everything that you can it's okay to walk away yes. from something that is no longer serving you that is putting possibly putting you and children other folks in you know psychological emotional and possibly even physical harm's way that's not a failure again you survived this long wreck it's it's okay to accept yeah. that okay yeah i spent x number of years with this person did everything turn out the way i wanted it to no Am I mm-hmm. up deep in some other kind of grief and divorce or whatever it, mm-hmm. it is? Possibly, but you still get to walk away and start another chapter and, yeah. and be excited about the next chapter because all heroes journeys have those battles. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, when reach point that you are, yeah and when you reach that point that you are, yeah. And when you reach that point that you're finally over, it will just laugh. Yeah. Oh, exactly. you'll just laugh about it. I, I and mean, I know the woman that is now, and, and actually I knew her before my ex knew her and married her. And I mean, I have said to her, you know, anything ever happens, give me a call. But I also said, he's your problem now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, so there's the whole, you know, would I want him back? Oh, good Lord, no. Um, <laughs> he said, he's somebody else's problem. When they got married, it was like, yay, the Winnipeg dating pool has gotten suddenly less crazy <laughs> because these two balls of crazy went off and you know married each other so um, they, they just brought the overall drama down a notch so that's the other mm-hmm. part just accept it move on like you say laugh um yeah you know i do wonder sometimes how i got into it i realized in retrospect i fell in love mm-hmm. with being married to someone and that this was another mm-hmm. person that was excited to be married um yeah. as opposed to falling for the individual and that i did the thing that i think a lot of us do especially yes. if we've been again, raised in particular environments, you look for somebody's potential and and the idea of, oh, this is what they say they're going to be. And so I'm going to help them get to that place. And what you don't realize is they might never actually get to that place that they like telling Mm -hmm. a story and that all they're going to do is suck you dry and suck your your energy and your support Mm -hmm. because that's what makes you the supportive spouse and all these other things. So again, it's okay to walk away and, and accept that it wasn't everything you thought it was, but you survived yeah. it, you recognized it, and you're moving on. True. And if you're not ready to accept it now, just be open about it, that this yeah. is happening. Yeah. Um, maybe somewhere down the line, you will have the courage to finally see if you are in that shoe that we are talking. I mean, if you yeah. are in the oh, no, same as our shoe, then yeah. Like I said, I had alarm bells go off before my wedding. And didn't listen to them because I was, again, I, I was told certain things by some folks. I, I substituted my judgment for you know, their judgment for my own and mm-hmm. then did different things, I mean, along the way where, I mean, I even did the thing that I think about in retrospect where it was the whole, uh, well, maybe if we have a baby, that'll make things fine. And mm-hmm. I mean, I love my son, but I feel really bad that I brought him into the situation that he was in. Um, yeah. and, and I feel badly for that. But at the same time, I've got my son, so I don't I don't regret it. I just, but it took, it took me a long time to accept it because Mm -hmm. I was trying to break the cycle uh, that I saw with my folks and I thought I had done it. Whereas instead I just run into it (laughs) and and again, it's okay. We, we don't know what we don't know. And as you learn and grow, and so it's okay to sit there and go, well, I didn't know something at 20 that I know now at 50. That's yeah. normal human growth. So if you're not That's at that wisdom point, <laughs> coming yeah, into us as we age. <laughs> yeah. So if you're not at that place now, that's okay. Uh, like you say, just be open to it and know that getting to that place, you know, you might get there and you'll get there when you need to be there. Yeah. Um, Sharon, I just wanted to go back a bit. Um I don't know if I did mention, but you also you are also a survivor for some um, disorders like yeah. ADHD. I just wonder how you're able to take it being in that relationship. When how did you cope up? 
Well, what's interesting was that I wasn't diagnosed. The, my first mental health diagnosis came up um, when I was 25. It was after my first son was born. And I okay. ended up with postpartum depression. And I actually ended up being suicidal. So I almost drove mm -hmm. my car off a bridge and with my with my child in the, the car seat behind me. So uh, that was because of PTSD. Well, it, well, what I didn't realize or a mix was that it was, well, it was postpartum depression. So what had happened was what I didn't know at the time, and it was only going through going through therapy and other things that I'd actually had um, other mild depressive bouts, but I just took it as, you know, okay, well, you know, moody teenager or whatever. I also didn't know that I had ADHD. So what was interesting was that it took being suicidal to actually reach out for help, find out that, uh, you know, I, basically I would get treated for what was postpartum and then chronic mm -hmm. depression. And what was never addressed, and it wasn't really addressed until actually the divorce and the assault start, the bad stuff started to happen, was that I did have PTSD. What we didn't, what wasn't recognized at the time was they were looking at the trauma related to the assault. Mm -hmm. And it later, that um and in fact even at that time i got misdiagnosed as being bipolar too mm. what it would take years to figure out was that uh it was actually what was being referred to as bipolar too was the way my adhd and my trauma were mm. coming together so um, bipolar is known for cycling of ups and downs highs and lows mm. so you yeah. have hypomania and mania or depressive things. Well, what was happening was there's um, emotional regulation uh, is part of ADHD, your ability to emotionally regulate. So the combination of what trauma did to my brain, coupled yeah. with what ADHD does to my, my prefrontal cortex here in emotional yeah. regulation, they thought I was bipolar. And that that so that seemed to make sense and I used it to sort of organize my world. It's mm -hmm. been later and working with uh, the, the person that I currently work with to realize that actually I have trauma behaviors that literally go back to my childhood and mm -hmm. that they have shaped my entire life and that how these other things wove in and out um, made it more complicated. So I have managed. One of the things that I do now is actually teach people about mental health and, yeah. and our diagnoses. And I use pop culture. So I use the Marvel cinematic universe and i use um bts so i use Which i use cool I want to talk about and and i use them as models for explaining these things and realizing that more of us have these things than we think that they're within the normal realm of human experience and that in some cases there can actually be assets behind it so in other mm -hmm. words my trauma having healed from it i can spot certain things now and I can see things and I can help people. So those of us mm -hmm. with PTSD are, we're kind of like Wolverine or Captain Marvel in that we are powerful healers and we are yeah. excellent fighters and we will be social justice warriors and advocates. Um, and then there's other things like ADHD where it allows me to connect the dots. So once I had learned certain things, I realized that, oh, wait a second, this connects to the, all it took was somebody to explain it or for me to see things and go, oh, wait a second, I was connecting those dots, but I didn't have mm -hmm. ADHD and other little bits of information. I didn't have those things to draw. Like they were there in my brain and they were working. I didn't know what the labels were and I didn't know the clinical mm -hmm. parts behind it that actually yeah. made those connections stronger. So there's actually some assets that we have and that those of us that have gone through these things, I mean, yeah. in some respects, that's actually where some of my survival skills came from was my neurodiversity and my, the mental health things that I'd already lived through. Did mm -hmm. it make it easy? No. In some cases, it made me more prone to divorce and that I actually had a second suicide attempt, um, suicide suicidal period in 2013. And it was while I was in office. And it was the culmination of, again, going through all the messy divorce stuff, things that were happening while I was in office, and then losing someone to postpartum depression that triggered stuff. But again, I bounced back a lot quicker and I went from mm -hmm. being suicidal at the beginning of August to the Minister of Healthy Living and responsible for the mental health portfolio by mid-October. Uh, <laughs> kind of like the other legislation thing went, okay, hold on, I'm responsible for this? 
Well, then I, again, mm-hmm. going, oh, look at fresh new batch of lemons here. Guess who's going <laughs> another lemon in the stand? Um, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, then I went, and then I also went public with my mental health when I went from being Minister of, of Healthy Living to the mm-hmm. Minister of Health, which is the second largest portfolio. And I was responsible for 50% of the Manitoba government budget. And mm-hmm. that was $6 billion and 1.3 million people. And it was a case of something came up here where we lost someone to suicide. I got involved with how to resolve what had happened at, in terms of that person being sent home from emergency departments and figured, you know what, I'm going to let other people know that this is okay. I'm not going to say that I'm the first health minister that the province has had that has mm-hmm. a mental health, had a mental health issue, but I'm going to be the first one that is public about it so that people know that I'm not just doing legislation and policy because this seems like a, you know, the thing I'm supposed mm-hmm. to do or somebody's told me to do it. It's because here's a gap in the system and I can see it from that lived experience. So again, yeah. lemons to lemonade. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I wonder how did you, that was, that was, that was fast, right? Recovering from that. What was, what was the key? Well, that- It was all the years that I'd had. So the key for me was the fact that I had over the years built up this toolkit. And so that even though my inner critic got the best of me and I fell down this hole, I also had a safety plan in place and was able to do certain things and had certain things kick in. I knew to reach out for help. So I reached Mm -hmm. out to a therapist and set up certain things. My kids and I had also, and it sounds like a lot to put on your kids, but one of the things that I have done as somebody with lived experience is I know what my triggers are for certain things or what might send me off down mm-hmm. a path and, and notice certain behaviors are, Ooh, there's, again, there's a, a red flag. There's a warning sign that something's happening. But I've also said to people in my family, if you see me doing certain things or acting certain ways, mm-hmm. it's okay to ask. Um, and so we've got little catchphrases and little things that we use, like, again, to use a Marvel thing, my son, my yeah. oldest one, uh, for those that are familiar with Bucky Barnes and how Bucky can be triggered by the code words that Hydra put in his brain. Uh-huh. And at one point there is a line that Steve Rogers says to him, which Bucky am I talking to? In other words, are you Bucky, my childhood friend? Or are mm-hmm. you Bucky that's been, you know, had this, his switch flip? And I remember my son one day, on the phone and I, he, he noticed something in the tone of my voice and he said, mom, which Bucky am I talking to? And he, mm-hmm. so that was that, that's like a little phrase that we will use now to just check in on somebody. What Bucky am I talking to? Are you okay? Is everything good? Okay. It's nothing. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Oh, it is something. What do you need me to do? And so there's another part. So having a safe place and where your family and, or again, and I, and I, I use family in the sense of those people that are your, they might be family by blood or they might be family or not. by choice. And, and so who in your circle have that and be ready to have those conversations and make those kinds of conversations normal so that if something does happen and you don't catch it, you lose that self-awareness. That's one mm-hmm. of the first things we lose when we go into yeah. mental health crisis is the self-awareness. So if other people are able to say in a safe way, that you, you know, they can ask that question and you go, oh, okay, you know what? I said that you could ask the question that way. So I know that if you're asking me this or if you're saying this, you're not being stigmatizing, judgmental. Mm-hmm. I might, I still might not be in a mental health place that I really appreciate you saying that, but you've mm-hmm. at least said it in the way that we agreed upon. Yeah. So you're doing something out of love and compassion to protect me. Okay. Let's let's have some conversations. Let me barf out some stuff and see what we can do and start doing those things. So that's the other part for folks is is create that kind of circle and those kinds of code words. But no mental health. Um, it's been a well, it's it's a super I, I call it a superpower, because when you look at true superpowers, people think of, oh, it's all the good stuff and superpowers yeah. come with pros and cons. They always come with some kind of weight and the superhero's journey is always about there's always an balance. enemy <laughs> yeah. well and it's about finding the balance because nobody just runs around yeah. using your powers because when they do that they usually find out oh i just ran around and did x but oops mm-hmm. this happened so a su- true superhero it's about learning to strike the balance and that so it comes with there it's neutral 
but it can either wreak havoc on our lives if left unchecked, or we can do great things with it if we are empowered, but it doesn't come without a cost. So that's how I look at it. It's been, it's been interesting, though I will say, like going back to the domestic violence part of it, I got the, um, the, the, that misdiagnosis of uh, bipolar. My ex-husband to this day, whenever mm -hmm. he visits my youngest son, will say, oh, so what's it like being raised by a bipolar mom? Oh. As if there's a bad thing and if he's waiting for, you know, that, that somehow I couldn't parent if I was bipolar. And it's like, yes, I could. Some there's there's some been some phenomenal folks that have led countries um, with mental health issues. And then in some respects, there's a wonderful book uh, by Nasser Gamey that says we're actually better crisis leaders. So um, but that but again, there's that stigma and there's that narcissist thing where he's still trying to get at the kids to say mom's broken yeah it's, it's a very it's a very uh um some interesting so yeah uh, yeah i'm just know. about to greet um first i'd like to greet the lisa alvarado hi um interesting topic enlightening my fam and i've been through a lot thank god he kept us in the palms of his hands and sorry i can't read are you able to read that on your end yeah, um bro. sharon can you yeah. read it for me Yes, as many will say it's cliche, but to this day, God backs us up. Only people who've been through the same experience and challenges will understand and believe. Exactly. It's it's definitely one of those things that it is really hard for somebody that hasn't lived through it to understand. True. And it's frustrating. Um, we can keep telling our stories in hopes that people will get it. But sometimes it's, it's sort of like, you know, if I went and flew to some like, you know, a uh, small little community up in, you know, northern Finland where they, you know, in the lap and, and, and explain to you how people live there. Yeah. If, if it, I might not have believed it otherwise until I got there. And that my trying to explain it to, you know, anybody else would be like, well, no, people can't live that way. They can't eat that way. It's too cold to live there. Yeah. You don't know. And so sometimes all we ask You don't know until, you until you get there. Until you yeah. get there. And all we ask is that other people... We're not asking you to come on that place. We don't want you to travel to that. Oh, definitely. Place. yeah. But just recognize that just because you haven't been there doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you can't support us. It just means that you believe us and take our experience for what it is that it's, you know, yeah. just help us. And, and if you don't know how to help, because that's the other part, is that yes. a lot of times because it's outside the experience, people don't know how to help ask us mm. wouldn't and, know how to handle it right yeah um yeah and if you know they say if you can't say anything good just don't say anything yeah. um sometimes if you really cannot handle um a person in this situation and you don't know what to say but just be a listening ear just be there to listen because it really really helps sometimes that person wouldn't want the other person to really talk but he just needs a friend he or she just needs a friend who will listen to what she or he's going through mm -hmm. a good question to ask is if somebody if it feels like they want to talk and again this goes even to the mental health thing is that sometimes when we need to talk we're not necessarily looking for solutions we are looking for just literally to get it all out because sometimes we're processing and figuring it out while we speak. So if you're not sure and you're worried that I don't have answers, you can say to somebody, it sounds like you really need to talk. Do you need to talk just so that I, I can, do you have somebody to listen to you and be heard? Or are you looking for me to come up with solutions? Because I'm here to lis listen and just knowing sometimes you actually want it where somebody is just going to listen, stop interrupting me with a solution. <laughs> I just need to barf it out. So it's okay to say like, I'm here to listen. I can't, I don't think yeah. I have any answers, but I'm here to listen. Tell me what you need to tell me. It matters. It matters. Yeah. So that's the other part is if, if you think you can't help because it's outside of your experience, just be there to listen. Exactly. You said it so well. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Yeah. Hi. So that's Tita Dolly. So that's my mom's office mate who just uh, shared <laughs> this thoughts to us. Thank you, Tita Dolly. Yeah. And um, I think that's one good also. One thing good to practice is to check on your friends. 
Yeah. Check on your family members. Just say hello. Sometimes when, you know, you are too busy, you're not trying to check on anyone, but once in a while, if you say, hi, how are you? And if that person is going through something, I think it also helps. Yeah, and especially in the pandemic right now, it, that's been even yeah. tougher because we, we're used to seeing people. And sometimes we don't think of checking in or we or we, we go from one extreme to another where it's like, oh, my gosh, I need to people. I need to talk to people. And then other then it's like the you start you kind of really go into the isolation part of, oh, I don't want to bug people or I'm sure they're doing fine. And so, no, mm -hmm. it's like we definitely need to be checking in on each other. And you don't have to have answers to help people. You know, yeah. being a friend and being a support is not about being a fixer or having all the answers. Sometimes it's just about being, uh, you know, being someone, there. <laughs> a space where someone can just, again, barf out all the stuff that they need to get out yeah. of their head and out of their heart. So. True. Yeah. Um, I know that you're a former... Uh, uh, former in the government, formerly in the government as Minister of Health, I think you may have some tips. I know the numbers are growing now. Yeah. Well, uh, well, basically in the past, we just talked about mental issues in the adults. Mm -hmm. But now more and more teens and kids are going through this problem as well. So yeah. any tips, any advice that... Uh, you can well, share with us. I, absolutely, no. It's it's definitely something. If there is it, this lousy cloud that is the pandemic, if there is a silver lining that I hope we can draw from it, is the fact that it's brought mental health conversations uh, up a lot more, and that yeah. for many of us that live with mental health issues, folks that again outside of their experience didn't necessarily understand what we were going through are now yeah. unfortunately experiencing this stuff and and so there's some <laughs> of us going okay welcome to my world um now you get it I'm, I'm glad you're only getting a small appetizer taste off the menu but now you uh, you've at least dipped your toe into this water and kids it's been really hard on kids it's not to say yeah. that there haven't been mental health issues there before but it's been a lot tougher because in many respects they've had a lot more taken from them and they've mm -hmm. had it taken from them without the benefit of life experience. So as much as we're going through lockdown and all of these other things and it's new, as adults, yeah. you've got a little bit more life experience under your belt and you're hopefully a little bit more adaptable, flexible. Kids have literally had this all. So you're seeing increased levels of anxiety. Uh, yes. You're seeing increased levels of things like depression, also the social isolation. So in terms of advice, a lot of it is about listening to your kids finding mm -hmm. new ways of doing things with your kids so together yeah do things yeah you know, we did oh my gosh when lockdown first started i mean for starters my youngest one lives at home but my oldest one and his partner and their child ended mm -hmm. up also having to move in with us <laughs> um, <they were> <laughs> oh. a little bit as they were looking for a house but then lockdown happened so they were living with us and looking for a house in a pandemic mm -hmm. so we had a lot of family game nights but we also oh, had okay. conversations around boundaries because that's the other thing is how many people are running you know they're they're working first of all they're living out of their house but they're also working and possibly doing like remote schooling all these things yeah so we're, we're all under uh, that's what's happening here <laughs> yeah. we have homeschooling so we're all in everybody's faces and it's you know what you love i I love my kids, but there's something to be said for when you both go off to school and work and you see yourself at the end of the day. It's another thing where, oh my God, there's no, there's not three minutes so where you're away from each other. So have spaces and, and, and times away and, and find activities that you can both do on your own and together. Uh, mm -hmm. Find ways of doing positive things, but giving each other space. Also know that things like playing video games and going online might be, if, if you've got access to those things, might be the way that some kids are able to maintain social relationships with their, yeah. their friends. And so that it's okay. And, um, and just recognize that nobody is bringing their A game right now. Mm -hmm. We are all stressed out, so we are all going to be a little twitchier, a little edgier. We're all going to be a little snippier, more prone to anger, frustration. Yeah, and That's okay, because right now, while those are not great behaviors, 
those are behaviors that are completely in line with their <laughs> normal behaviors for going through a pandemic. It doesn't mean you yeah. can run around and be a total pain in the behind to everyone and go, it's a pandemic, I'm allowed to be a jerk. <laughs> but recognize that we're all coming at this from a less than perfect place and that if we all do that to each other and we're all a little kinder to each other mm -hmm. and to ourselves and that you do you know find little indulgences and they don't have to be it's not about you know self-care in terms of i'm going to go to the spa and get my nails done because those are all closed it's about yeah. <laughs> you do at home for yourself is it about gee you know there's a certain kind of cookie that your kid liked and you haven't been able mm -hmm. to make so I know some of us have gone through some baking spells, but, you know, do things yeah. like that. Go for walks where you can engage in whatever way that you can that makes you feel safe. And that also allows some breathing room because we do still need space. breathing room and yeah. space. And again, know that there is nothing wrong if you are feeling stressed out. That is probably the most normal response. <laughs> and yes. About those self-care. Like, so you talked about, you know, gratitude. Yes. Okay, I'm stuck in my house and I'm stuck in my house with my five kids. Well, wait a second. I'm grateful for the fact that I have a house and I have five yeah. kids and that we can cook a meal together. Do they have, sure. do you have to be grateful for huge things? This is not about gratitude for winning a lottery. It's the be grateful for that. Let go of the fact that you're not, this is not normal. So things, you know, let go of the fact that your kid might not have the birthday party that you wanted. Mm -hmm. Let go of the fact that you're not going to have the holiday or whatever else it was that you were going to have, but you're going to have something different and you might, you get to it later. Um, yeah. You know, let go self, again, the self-awareness was the whole, yes. like, recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> the game. Um, detach, again, detach from those things that you have no control over. We have no control over the virus, what other yes. folks are doing in response to it and how this, so what is it that's within your control? You can do all the things related to your own, again, keeping your house, you know, what you're doing in terms keeping of keeping yourself act, safe, keeping <laughs> yeah. yourself safe. Exactly. Um, and, and then like you're saying that, that idea of reparenting the, and that's a really huge, it's one. a, yeah, that I think that's a big word. Maybe it, um, it will consume like a whole new episode. <laughs> But yeah, well, that, we can just say it out loud. Yeah, you, when you reparenting yourself, like recognizing that in many respects, a lot of the responses a lot of us are going to have is going to be as wounded kids. So treat yes. yourself the same way you would as if your five year old was acting that way. If you're what, what would your five year old need if they were behaving this way? And you know that they're stressed out or they're lonely or they're sad or they're disappointed. Well, you're allowed to look after five year old you. And, yes. and, and hold five-year-old you in your arms the same way and, and heal five-year-old you. And that, that that's okay. And that that's probably one of the healthiest things to do because reparenting allows us to actually grow up. Certain things that happen to us, trauma freezes us at a certain yes. age. And so when we reparent ourselves, then we pick up there and then we let that child grow up to the healthy child that they and healthy mm -hmm. adults that they didn't get the chance to be in that area. So, I mean, your, your five steps there really encapsulate so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, those are words that you, you, you still need to expound. Yeah, that's what I said. Maybe it still needs like a whole new episode to, <laughs> talking about reparenting because there are a lot of things into it. But, yeah, but those five words can be good for now. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And rather than add five more new things, here's just a variation on those five and, and that how they apply in this circumstance. Because I think a lot of times we think here's a toolkit for this and here's a toolkit for that. And there's and don't get me wrong, there's some differences, but sometimes there are just there are things like that that they can be carried into any situation. They might yeah. run a little differently, but there that's that is a toolkit to carry through life twenty four seven, three sixty five. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And, you know, I think it's sad that when we grow older, we stop being a child. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. As somebody that's right? in a room that's filled with uh, K-pop and superhero stuff and gets weird looks for it. Honestly, um, I think the part of me that has contributed most to my health and well-being is that part of my brain that's sort of frozen at 17 
that um, mm -hmm. that's so cool. Enjoy these things, explore new things, and and not be living in some sort of nostalgia thing. So that's the other part. Age, your chronological age is how many times you've you know made rotations around the sun, but it should never define who you are and always yeah. some part of your youth and see the world through a child's eyes because that's also where we grow too and, yeah. and where some of our healing comes from so no i totally agree with you <laughs> yeah i think that that's the thing when you are at certain age you are expected to behave this way you're not supposed to dress up this way but at, again and again that's like how society thinks yep and that's how we shake stuff up. Are you, okay, some. I mean, I don't know if anybody noticed my <laughs> dark pink hair. Um, it's so cool. I like it. <laughs> well, the thing is, though, is I've, I've had a lot of grief for this. So back in the 80s, yes, I had multicolored hair as a teenager when that stuff first started happening. And I almost got kicked out of school. But the principal realized he couldn't pick out a kid that was in the advanced program because of the color <laughs> of her hair. So yeah. that my color went in and out of my hair at different points. And then I, again, it, it had to, you know, it stopped when I went into office because uh, it was about, you know, being appropriate. But again, I mentioned about the assault and the being diagnosed with cancer. Well, what was interesting was around the time I was going through my diagnosis, I was at an event at the local high school uh, that was for breast cancer research. And the school had rallied around and raised this crazy amount of money. For breast cancer research and it's because they rallied around this one young girl and i met her mm -hmm. and we started talking and it turns out that she had lost her mom but she'd also lost her dad a few years before mm -hmm. so she was now raising her little sister um as she was going into grade 12 she'd had all of these struggles and different mm -hmm. things what i would come to realize was not only with the and there's a a, a 10-year age gap between her and her little sister which was the same age gap between my boys so that each of she was about 18 months older than my oldest and then her mm -hmm. old, younger sister was 18 months older than my youngest one so we we connected we talked i would later come to find out that her mom was actually somebody that i knew as mm -hmm. a child we had actually been altar servers together at the same church growing up mm -hmm. and we had just parted ways at a, at a young age going to different schools and this kind of stuff and what i had done was when i basically put pink in my hair in memory of her before I even realized she was a childhood friend. And so I kept it in there because for me it was, I needed to do this for both Danette and I. So I did it mm -hmm. for me and my kids to get through my cancer diagnosis, but it was mm -hmm. also for her and her two girls because they were in my, they'd come into my world and my life. And I mm -hmm. had a lot of pushback from it. And at the same time, it became sort of a marker of who I was in the neighborhood. So I'm the first person in the provincial government, the Manitoba government with pink hair. I think I'm also the first cabinet minister with pink hair. And I think I might be the first cabinet minister with pink hair. <laughs> I, got about it. I even, when I saw it re-election, they took pictures of me and then they photoshopped it out. <laughs> and I was like, why would you do that? Everybody in the neighborhood knows me as a lady with pink hair. And what was interesting was that Yes, it made me stand out. Yes, some people didn't like it. But what mm -hmm. it also did was it started conversation. So I would have people say, well, why do you have that? And I'd say, well, I'm a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, their thought about my having pink hair had changed. It went from there's the crazy lady with pink hair to, oh, wait a minute. And so, and I mentioned about what I was doing. And in fact, one conversation that I had with somebody at this event, at a big event, I was talking to somebody from the university and this person, you know, it was that they were part of this conversation and I mentioned the pink hair and I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, this, this young woman, Pascal, and mentioned actually how she would be going to university. And so he actually asked me for all of her details, like, you know, can I get in touch with her? And it turns out he offered her a scholarship knowing that she was, so another, you know, it, there were different things that came out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's the other part is be yourself. You yeah. might have to fight against things. Um, yes, this is not always considered age appropriate, but you know what? I'm 54 years old. I really don't. You don't, don't look like 54. Going. Come on, Sharon. Yeah. Good lighting, good moisturizer. And again, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know how much underneath here is actually gray anymore. Um, <laughs> but you know, I don't, I don't care. This is, this is what makes me feel happy. This yeah. is who I am. And yes, does it mean that some people don't take me seriously or they think there's something you know what then they're not my people 
And it it is a challenge, but recognize it's better to be yourself and you'll yes. find ways of fitting in where you need to fit in. And so there's the, the, that's the other part too, is that a lot of times when we're victims of narcissists, we lose who we are. We are. And so yes. that's where reclaiming our youthful perspective, our childhood, we're entitled to that. And we get to re- we get a do over. You get to go back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's self love. Yes. Yeah. We're loving ourselves. Um, we're being ourselves. Yeah. If you don't like it, well, I'm sorry, but this is me, right? Yeah. There's 7 billion people on the planet. I can't please everybody. I can't be everybody's friend. I don't want to be a lot of their friends. <laughs> people. So I'm going to be me and my people will find me. And it's the same thing with everyone else. So do what feels right in your heart. And even if you feel pushback from other folks, because it's not age appropriate or it's not appropriate to your social position whatever it is you know yes again i wasn't you know like i've got tattoos as well i didn't i you know i watched where i got tattoos while i was in office they were always things that i could cover up now i don't care so i have i've got one here on my wrist and it's about being uh, a suicide survivor so it's a lotus with the the semicolon that Mm -hmm. uh, is is used as a, a suicide survivor sign again i'm sure it's not socially acceptable for a lot of folks yeah that's not my problem. That's a them problem. That's not a me problem. True, true. But do what yeah. works for you. Yeah, I think that's one thing that we should get out of as well, pleasing people. Um, but that is what sometimes social media teaches a lot of people because yes. they need to be liked, um, viewed, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and, and again, there's always some kind of negotiation. You can't be you know, going through life as a total bull in the china shop and being, you know, either rude or disrupting things in in it. So there's, there's, but there's always a way that you can still be yourself, stand up for yourself. And it just takes us a while sometimes to figure out what that is. But that a lot of times that when we have been victims of narcissists, that's like one of the first things that we lose. And Mm -hmm. that's one of the things that is part of our recovery journey is to claim that. So um, add that to the equation of, 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 (laughs) to look after your your mental health here too just in the yes. pandemic as long as you're not harming anyone you're exactly. doing good for yourself exactly. way to go do what you want do what yeah. makes you happy do yeah. what makes you feel good yep yeah, exactly as long as it's not harm, ca- causing harm to yourself or others then it's just in it, it, do those things exactly that's that's a very good point no harm to others <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um i think i've i've I have a lot, I've asked a lot of questions, but maybe um, Sharon, you may have some parking words to our viewers tonight well, or morning your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I just want to thank you. This has been wonderful. I hope it's Aww. been useful to the folks that have been viewing. And if they have any questions, any other ones, I would love to answer them. But honestly, it really comes down to uh, loving yourself, knowing yourself and knowing that this is a journey. And that yes. what you know about yourself now is definitely something different than what it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. And it's going to be different than what you know about yourself 5, 10, 15 years from now, or even 5, 10, 15 days from now. And that's okay. And that's actually, that's growth if you're different and you know more yeah. than you did. Uh, that if you have been involved with someone that's a narcissist that has caused you harm, don't beat yourself up. Don't blame yourself. Like I said, they're often giving Oscar winning performances. So <laughs> you just bought the, the, the really good acting. You're not to blame. Uh, and, and that love yourself through that. See what you have learned from it. Know that you are strong. And that, you know, we, we all have gifts and assets. And just take care of yourself uh, first and foremost. Keep a strong circle around you know that it's okay to leave behind people that aren't on your side or are Mm -hmm. harming you it's not going to be easy to prune those branches but it's okay and that yeah if something doesn't fit into loving and caring for yourself it's okay to give it a second thought and possibly prove it. So no, thank you for having me here and for creating. Well, thank you so much. Space for people 
to learn about these issues, to talk about them. That this is this is really important right now is having these kinds of conversations. So thank you for doing it and thank you for having me here. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for accepting my invitation and for sharing your knowledge, your experience and tips to yeah. all of us. Thank you so so much. A anytime I can be useful to you and your viewers please let me know. This has been wonderful. And I really appreciate what you're doing because this supports and helps so many people in so many ways. So thank oh, you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Sharon. Um, yes, Tita Dali said, yes, thank you. Thank you, you too. Yes, thank you too, Tita Dali, for watching and for yes. sending all your <laughs> words. Family. Yay. You got yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So thank you, Sharon. Please take care. Yes. Um, it's still a whole day ahead of you today, right? <laughs> yeah, it's only 1045 in the morning here. It's probably yeah. time every over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless, thank you. Please keep safe and I'll keep in touch. I think we still have a lot to talk about. Okay, anytime. <laughs> Please take care. care. Bye bye. Bye. So thank you so much, guys, for being here and for watching, for listening. We hope, Sharon and I, hope that you were able to um, have some light uh, with all the sharings that we had. And uh, as I always say, you are enough. You are beautiful. And I just picked up one word from Sharon. You are strong. All right, so this has been a wonderful Real Talk episode with Sharon Blady. I hope to see you again soon. Um, it will be the Sunday after next Sunday. So please take care. God bless you. It's still a pandemic, but we will get through this. And God bless to all of you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>